today's the, the last day for 3D Monsters. Yeah, it's, and uh, it, then in a few weeks we'll have uh, a new exhibit. Uh, no glasses required. The uh, lenticulars and holograms. Ah, much like uh, these ones on the wall here. Yeah, yeah. The, actually, uh, there'll be some carryover. We'll, we'll keep these up because these are just so wonderful. Mm -hmm. yes. uh, but we'll have a, a lot more, uh, some actual holograms. Oh, nice. We're taking one of the ships. Why is it's, it's one of the first uh, commercial uses of the McKenzie Endless Loop Magnetic Tape. Okay, yeah. Um, the McKenzie Tape was invented in 1954. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't think it was commercially available until 1957. So this mm -hmm. was a very early use of the Endless Loop Tape. Yeah. Uh, in 55, I think Disneyland was using them for the audio animatronics. Yeah, I, I think you're right. Yeah, that's... Uh... That so it would right. kind of make sense that Paul Terry would look for the same technology. So, so, so even though this, uh, even though this particular machine didn't catch on, Paul Terry was still very ahead of his time oh, in, yeah, in, yeah. Well, in basically every way. Paul Terry was was uh, quite a, a fan of or a supporter of 3D. Mm -hmm. The first 3D comic book was a Mighty Mouse comic book. Okay, yeah. Um, the uh, artist who came up with process for making 3D comics, uh, Joe Kubert and Norman Maurer, mm -hmm. um, they, they called it Illustereo, mm. uh, and it was their patent pending process for uh, putting the art on multiple layers of cells, mm -hmm. photographing it for the left eye, and then shifting the cells left and right to make the right eye. And you were, you were showing us uh, when we were yeah, here a few yeah, weeks ago yeah. about the, uh, the the 3D conversion just with the, the cutouts the over there. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So, Kubert um, uh, and Maurer shopped that around mm -hmm. to uh, uh, all the different comic book publishers, mm -hmm. and they ended up selling or licensing it to St. John's Press, mm -hmm. which was already doing uh, the Mighty Mouse comic books. Mm -hmm. And they went into production on uh, Mighty Mouse and the Three Stooges. Ah. And actually, Norman Maurer was uh, Moe's son-in-law. Oh, okay. So they intended the Three Stooges to be the first 3D comic book, but actually uh, Mighty Mouse got published first. Okay. Uh, Three Stooges was the second. But at that point, uh, they, they did three issues of Mighty Mouse, uh, a couple of issues of the Three Stooges, and a bunch of others. And uh, um, William Gaines, who ran EC Comics, they did Tales from the Crypt. Right, right. Um, they wanted the Illustereo process. They were he was actually quite upset that St. John's Publications got it, not EC. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, did a patent search. Actually found an existing patent from the 1930s that seemed like the process they mm -hmm. were using. Uh, they contacted the guy. His name was Owens. The patent was about to expire. EC bought that patent. <laughs> and then sued St. John's for patent infringement. And it actually went to court. Paul Terry um, sent in a testimony that uh, while this is a trade secret and I can't reveal how they actually do it, I can say that it's not the method used in the patent. <laughs> so it, it, it's kind of interesting, these sort of interconnections with Paul Terry being involved with 3D. Yeah, yeah. It's, um... And actually, the Three Stooges, there's some connections there, too. Mm -hmm. um, the Three Stooges did two 3D films in 1953. Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, one was called Spooks, and one was called Pardon My Backfire. And uh, Spooks is... Uh, Mo, Larry, and Shemp are detectives, mm -hmm. and they get uh, a call to go to... Uh, mad scientist's haunted house to find a kidnapped girl. The mad scientist wants to uh, uh, put her brain into a gorilla's body. Mm -hmm. and uh, um, Allowing them to do... Of, lots of yeah. eye poking and knife throwing and hypodermic needles and things like that. Co combining the 3D versions of Stooges gags with 3D versions of haunted house gags. Yeah, so. yeah exactly. In fact, there's, there's a great sequence where... Uh, um, they say this house isn't haunted. If it was, it would have bats. And then a bat flies right into the camera. <laughs> they cut to a close-up, and the, the bat has Shemp's face. 
So it's it's uh, and then Shemp proclaims it like the ugliest bat he's ever seen. <laughs> it's pretty funny. And part of my backfire, uh, they're auto mechanics, mm. and uh, they're working in a, a garage, and some gangsters bring their car in to get repaired. And uh, while they're fixing the car, they hear a radio story about the gangsters. <laughs> so mayhem ensues in the garage. Of course. <laughs> with you know, oil cans and flamethrowers and uh, uh, anything that you could spray or, or point at the camera. <laughs> so, so that's kind of fun. And there's actually, I've got, uh, they put out 8mm home versions. Mm. Uh, these are both excerpts from Spooks. Mm -hmm. So if, if you wanted to watch a 3D movie at home, you could get the 8mm version, mm -hmm. run it on your own projector, and use red and blue glasses to watch it. Slightly more affordable than the uh, 3D Blu-rays. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I haven't confirmed it yet, but I've been told that Mo uh, was an amateur 3D photographer. Mm. Yeah, hello. Welcome to 3D Space. No, 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 we can carry it. No, come here, we can carry it. And Moe's grandson mm -hmm. wrote the screenplay for the first 3D animated feature film in 1985. Oh, wow. Those are 3D photos taken by Bob and Kathy Burns. Bob is a, a horror and sci-fi memorabilia collector. And uh, uh, he worked on horror films in the 1950s. In the 60s and 70s, he was one of the busiest gorilla suit performers. So if you see a gorilla in there, that's Bob. Bob, in his collection, he actually has one of the original armatures from King Kong. Nice. Um, and when the 1976 King Kong opened, they made a life-size King Kong head for the Chinese theater. Oh, I love <laughs> That's fun. Very cool. How did you guys hear about this? We we actually wandered in a few weeks ago because because oh, really? we were uh, checking something else out in the area and we saw the sign. It looked really cool, and so we we came down and we wanted to come back one more time before this exhibit ended. Uh, the red and blue glasses are used for things that are printed. Like, like comic books. Uh, typically for movies, they're shown using polarized glasses. And this is a polarized monitor. You were talking about uh, how the earlier 3D films, uh, but before they figured out the polarization technology, were uh, more, more primitive in their oh, yeah, development. Yeah, yeah. The, the, uh, the, well, the earliest 3D movies uh, were shown using red and green or red and blue filters. Mm -hmm. um, because there really, there really wasn't a practical technology to show them. Sure. Um, so in the 1920s, uh, the first 3D feature film was called The Power of Love, 1922-23. Uh, it's a lost silent film, so mm. uh, I, I can't tell you what it actually looked like, whether the 3D worked, because uh, I don't think there's anyone alive who has seen it. Probably not. Um, there were... Uh, a number of various tests uh, done in the 1920s, and then there were there were uh, uh, several of these films that, that actually do survive. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of a lot of the same kind of what can we stick at the camera kind of thing. Of course, of course. And then in the 1930s, uh, MGM did uh, a series of films they called the Metroscopic Films. Mm -hmm. Audioscopics, which actually won an Academy Award, it was a compilation of some of the test films from the 1920s. Mm -hmm. uh, new Audioscopics, which was more of that footage, mm -hmm. and then a film called Third Dimensional Murder. In fact, Third Dimensional Murder, this mm -hmm. was the one from mm -hmm. 1941. This was originally shown with red and blue glasses. Mm -hmm. Then later converted for, uh, for modern screens. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's available. Um, well, it's actually not available anywhere right now. Um, so it's one of a kind right here. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's uh, part of, of the MGM back catalog, so it's actually owned by Warner Brothers. Ah, uh, yeah. Um, uh, I, I have a 35 millimeter print. Oh, wow. Um, that uh, hopefully someday I'll actually get to show somewhere. So. If you, if you get the space for a full 35 millimeter 3D theater. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, I actually, I do have a, I have a 
portable 35 millimeter projector. Mm -hmm. So if I wanted to show a red and blue film, I could do it. Actually, I could probably even show some of the single strip split left and right films from the 1970s mm -hmm. so, and 80s. Black Lagoon, of course, Creature yeah. from the Black Lagoon. That's one of my favorites. <laughs> oh, oh, hey, nice. Well, yeah, you know, it's uh, the Creature's one of my favorites, too. And, uh, um, it came rather late in Universal's horror series. Mm -hmm. um, you, know, you had uh, Dracula, Frankenstein, Wolfman, The Mummy, that were all uh, really popular in the 1930s and 40s. <laughs> By the 50s, they were kind of parodying the Universal monsters, Abbott and Costello and Frankenstein. Yeah. Um, but, uh, um, Creature from the Black Lagoon came out in 1954, uh, toward the end of the 3D fad, and a huge hit. Interestingly, the second one, Revenge of the Creature, reminds me an awful lot of The Shape of Water. Hmm. Actually, I haven't seen that yet. You haven't seen that? Because The Shape of Water is... I, 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 I'm, I'm sure it was an influence for Del Toro, oh, yeah. He's, he has said yeah. that, you know, he wanted to make Creature from the Black Lagoon. Um, <laughs> Yeah, because in Revenge of the Creature, they go back to the Amazon, they capture him, and they bring him to an aquarium in Florida, mm -hmm. uh, both to study and then put him on display. And, of course, he escapes. Um, not nearly as good as the original, uh, but it is kind of a, a cool that they did this direct sequel. Mm -hmm. Creature Walks Among Us begins with the Creature on a rampage, and they set him on fire, and he's horribly, horribly burned. And to save his life, they perform surgery and they remove his gills and discover, oh wait, he has lungs too, so he can breathe on land. And then they put clothes on him and he walks around killing people. Really, really terrible. <laughs> um, and uh, the guy that they cast to play the gill man uh, has like the build of a wrestler. Mm. So he doesn't even you know, he's not this this sleek fish man. He's this big hulking guy who's just wearing a creature head and <laughs> clothes and walking around killing people. It's like if you put Dwayne Johnson in the role or yeah, something. Yeah, yeah. The gorilla one is kind of fun. It's from 1982. It's also from TV broadcasts. I believe it was for Gorilla at Large mm -hmm. when that showed on TV. I and it's scratch and sniff. Oh. <laughs> so if you scratch the banana part, it still smells. They, they still work from 1982. Ah. And I've actually, I've got three of them in the door prizes today. So oh, fun. This is an interesting one. This is a... Um, no, I had no idea. 1953. So it's the Viewmaster Model C. Mm. Uh, it's a Bakelite. And uh, the reel that I have in here is actually a promotional reel for the movie The Maze. Mm. Uh, it was kind of cool. The, uh, the movie, obviously it was 3D. Um, if a theater wasn't showing a 3D movie, they couldn't run a 3D trailer. Sure. So they made these promotional reels to put out in theaters ah. so that people could get a taste of what the 3D from the movie would look like.